my name is Bob Scharf. I'm uh, happy to welcome to you, uh, you on behalf of the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies to this uh, annual and very joyous occasion. And um, just before I get going, if you go to the Buddhist, uh, the Center for Buddhist Studies uh, webpage uh, and go to events, you'll notice we have a lot of events um, still coming up this semester, uh, including a screening of the, the film Tukdam, a conference on, um, two-day conference on secrecy in Japanese Buddhism, I think that's March 2nd and 3rd, and then after that is a conference on the Buddhist Vinaya. Uh, so um, be sure to check out our webpage if you are uh, interested in Buddhist Studies events. Um, before we get going, it is my pleasure to introduce George Tanabe, who's both a, a colleague, um, well-known professor of uh, Japanese Buddhism, and also the president of the Bukyo Dendo Kyokai, uh, or the Numata Foundation that sponsors the Toshihide uh, Book Award in Buddhism. So George is going to say a few words to introduce you to the BDK. Thank you. I think most of you know all about BDK. And I've given this talk, I don't know how many times that we've had this award ceremony and other events at, uh, at Berkeley. So maybe I'll just say, uh, remember the past uh, talks that I've given and you know all about BDK. But to refresh your memory, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> BDK is uh, Bukyo Dendo Kyokai, the Society for the Promotion of uh, Better Understandings of, of Buddhism. Uh, it was founded by uh, Mr. Ehan Numata, <coughs> uh, who in the early 20s uh, studied right here at UC Berkeley and graduated with degrees in mathematics and statistics, and then went back to Japan and uh, was wondering what he should do, what he could do in order to uh, promote Buddhism. And his answer was he should uh, found a company that would make some money that would be able to fund the different kinds of Buddhist projects, which is exactly what he did. He founded the Mitsutoyo Corporation, which today is the largest manufacturer of precision measuring instruments, and it's a multinational uh, corporation. And BDK was, was founded and is supported by uh, Mitsutoyo. So just as Mitsutoyo is a multinational, so is BDK, it's an international organization. And we're dedicated to uh, promoting better understandings of Buddhism in several ways. The first way is through that little orange book that you're all familiar with. It's a one volume compilation of uh, scriptural uh, passages. <clears throat> it's been translated into 40 something different languages and distributed throughout the world. To date, there are over 9 million copies that have been distributed mostly through hotels in over uh, 60 countries. And so uh, this is a very ambitious project that continues. Um, the second way in which we promote better understanding of Buddhism is an even more ambitious project, and that is to translate, ideally, the entirety of the Chinese canon. And uh, all of you know how big the Chinese canon is. It's got, what, how many, over 4,000 titles? How many titles are there in it? And to date, after 36 years of diligent effort, uh, we have published 96 of those thousands of titles. So I think it's fair to say that uh, none of us here in this room will be here when and if the project is ever finished. So um, with that happy thought, <laughs> we continue the work of, uh, of translating uh, these, uh, these texts. <clears throat> and the third way is through the establishment of uh, Numata centers and Numata programs at uh, 17 different uh, universities uh, throughout the, the world. Uh, UC Berkeley was the first to get a uh, Numata program, and the program has slowly expanded and continues to expand uh, in support of the uh, graduate study of uh, Buddhism. And um, <clears throat> just last year, um, we established a, uh, a endowed chair in Japanese Buddhist studies at the University of Chicago, and uh, we also reinforced the center uh, here at uh, UC Berkeley, and some of you were at the symposium for rededicating the uh, Center for the Study of uh, Buddhism, uh, for Buddhist Studies here at uh, UC Berkeley. So part of that is the, this prize, um, this competition, 
And I think Bob will explain a little bit about the mechanics of how it is uh, carried out. But it is named the Toshihide Numata Prize for the best book that is written in any given year on, on Buddhism. Toshihide Numata was the son of uh, Ehan Numata. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, several years ago, but uh, his name uh, continues on in this uh, prize, in this, this contest for the best book on um, Buddhism. So we're all uh, here to celebrate the, actually last year's winner, 2022, but we had to postpone it until, uh, until today. And so we're very happy to uh, have the winner and all of you here to celebrate the uh, 2022 winner of the Toshihide Numata uh, Prize for the best book uh, written on Buddhism for last year. Thank you. Uh, so as, as George mentioned, as, and as I think many of you know, the, uh, the uh, Toshi Award, I should say, it's an award, it's not a prize. We learned early on that if it's a prize, it's taxable, and if it's an award, it's not. Go figure. So the, uh, the Toshi Award in Buddhism is presented um, each year to the uh, best book in the area. It, it's something, it, it's worded something like makes the greatest contribution to Buddhist studies. Um, each year we appoint a external committee. Uh, the people on the co external committee don't know the other people on the external committee, so it really is a kind of uh, a blind process um, to uh, make the choices. They often are extremely perturbed at the, um, the selection because it really is often an apples and oranges and thing and they kind of write to us and they say, how are we supposed to do this? And we say, just pick the book that makes it what is in your opinion the greatest contribution to Buddhist studies for the year. Um, uh, this year's choice, uh, as you know, was The Buddhist Tooth, Western Tales of a Sri Lankan Relic by our guest here today, John Strong. Um, just a quick word. I, I should say that, that there was a tremendous enthusiasm for this particular book. Um, as you know, much has been written about Buddhist relics, uh, which seem to have been objects of devotion since the very beginnings of Buddhism, as far back as we can go. Um, and relics often, among other things, facilitated the spread of Buddhism throughout Asia, partly because they're so portable. Uh, John had done extensive work on the topic of relics in the past before writing this book. Uh, but the latest book is a new and extremely exciting turn, both for John and the field, I believe. The book looks at Western accounts dating from the 16th to the 20th century of two important Sri Lankan relics, which are kind of entwined with one another. Uh, the first is the account of the capture and destruction by the Portuguese in the 16th century of a tooth which is only later identified as a relic of the Buddha. And the second is looking at how the British handled the famous tooth relic at Kandy from the time the English forces uh, took control of the temple in which they were held uh, in 1815 up through the visit of the English queen in 1954. Uh, the accounts of the two relics, which turn out to be intertwined in intriguing ways, cover a stunning variety of sources and serves as a means to look anew and in great depth and tremendous sensitivity at the fraught colonial encounter with Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka and beyond. Now, members of the committee this year were understandably enthusiastic about the Buddha's tooth. Uh, one called it, quote, an outstanding piece of scholarship, exhaustively researched and beautifully written. Uh, he goes on, it, it is it, the rare book that can be said with benefit, that can be read with benefit and interest by anyone working in the area of Buddhist studies, as well as by scholars of colonial period South Asia, end quote. Another reviewer wrote it, that it builds on modern trends in Buddhist studies that emphasize materiality and the cross-cultural construction of modern Buddhism, but goes significantly beyond them. So with that, I'd like to call George up again, and John and George will present the prize that comes along with an envelope to John. It gives me great pleasure and an honor to present the uh, prize to uh, John Strong for his book, um, The Buddha's uh, Tooth, in the singular, but I think there are several 
teeth. Tooth. So maybe we should say tooth <laughs> instead of teeth. Tooth. But at any rate, um, it's an accomplishment of many, many years. Uh, we were talking earlier about how long it took and uh, all the many different kinds of sources and languages that you had to deal with. And uh, now it's out and now it has been uh, scrutinized and deemed to be the winner of the 2022 Toshihide Numata uh, Book Award. Did I say prize? Uh, book Award. Um, no one from the IRS is here. No one from the IRS is here. Yeah. Well, now this is new, new news to me, which I'm very happy to hear about. I was just thinking the other day, whoa, it's, not, it's tax for last year, but maybe yeah. this is 2022 award. 2022 award. And so it, the, 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 it's, okay. it's gone now. Yeah, you're, 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 you're fine. Yeah, Bob solved the problem when we renamed the pro prize right. to award. Yeah, so, um, so you get to keep all of it. So. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I'll just say a few words uh, to introduce our speaker today, John Strong. Uh, John is the uh, Charles A. Dana Professor of Religious Studies Emeritus at Bates College. He was born in Hebei in China, which I just learned when I was looking at uh, the CV he sent me. Um, and schooled in Geneva, Switzerland, as well as New Jersey. So uh, truly a cosmopolitan upbringing before he even hit college. His undergrad was at Oberlin, his PhD in the Divinity School at Chicago, where he did his PhD research on the Ashoka Vedana. He spent much of his academic career at Bates, but has held a number of visiting uh, positions, including Harvard, Stanford, Chicago, Princeton, and institutions in Japan and Sri Lanka. Now, John is, is both highly respected and incredibly productive. His work combines impeccable philological precision in the handling of a wide array of sources with a larger interest in how Buddhism works as a lived tradition. It's very much, I think, um, you know, he received that that was the mark of the Harvard Divinity School, uh, at the Chicago Divinity School at the time. Uh, he writes uh, for both specialists and generalists and sometimes at the same time. So in addition to well over 50 articles, I lost count at a certain point, he's published a slew of books, including A Guide to the Buddhist Religion, co-authored with Frank Reynolds and John Holt in 81. The Legend of King Ashoka, a study and translation of the Ashoka Vedana in 83. The Legend and Cult of Upagupta, Sanskrit Buddhism in North India and Southeast Asia in 1991. The Experience of Buddhism in 94. The Buddha, a short biography in 2001. Relics of the Buddha in 2004. Buddhism, an introduction in 2015. And now the Buddha's Tooth. Indeed, I don't think, um, I think the, uh, nothing better exemplifies his ability to write for both specialists and the lay reader than the book that we're here to celebrate today. So I, uh, on behalf of all of us, I congratulate and welcome John, and we look forward to the keynote. Uh, thank you, Bob, for uh, those comments, and thank you, George Tanabe, and thanks to the BDK. I benefited before uh, from, from the Numata's generosity. Uh, I taught at the University of Chicago for one uh, quarter on a Numata professorship many years uh, uh, ago. And thank you to the uh, anonymous awards uh, committee. And thank you also, Sanjot uh, Mehendale, for all your, your help in, in this. And uh, a preliminary thanks to the three papers that will follow mine uh, by Anne Blackburn and Richard Davis and uh, Alicia uh, Turner. Uh, and thank all of you for coming. It's truly a, a, a great uh, honor to receive uh, this award. Um, the, the talk today is, uh, I hope, entertaining, I hope, uh, interesting, and I hope uh, we'll get the discussion started. Uh, I won't be talking about uh, the Portuguese part of the book. The book is divided into two sections, one dealing with 
the Portuguese tooth, or what I'm calling the Portuguese tooth, and the other one dealing uh, with the Sri Lankan tooth. I'll be staying on the uh, candy tooth uh, side of things. Uh, just to sort of introduce it, in, in 2004, as Bob mentioned, I wrote a book focused on the Buddhist, tra Buddhist traditions about relics of the Buddha. And the book we're discussing today, the, the Buddhist tooth, is about how non-Buddhists, and especially Western non-Buddhists in positions of power, have historically encountered and viewed one particular Sri Lankan Buddhist relic, the tooth of the Buddha. So part one deals with the Portuguese tooth, as I mentioned, and, uh, and we can talk about that in a discussion if you have questions uh, uh, about it. Part two is about how about British encounters with and treatments of the Buddhist tooth that's now in the town of Kandy in the center of the island of Sri Lanka. And, but this I will talk about by focusing on something very specific, a story that I came across when I was doing research in the National Archives of Great Britain in Kew outside of London. There quite serendipitously uh, an adjective, uh, advert chosen because of serendipity is an old name for Sri Lanka. There are quite serendipitously Sri Lanka coming up in the files of the Prime Minister's office. I found a dossier entitled, quote, Visit of Her Majesty the Queen, and the Queen we're talking about in the Queen's shoes is the late Queen Elizabeth II. So visit of Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh to the Temple of the Tooth at Candy Ceylon. I didn't have to do any work gathering materials for far and wide. It was all uh, put together by an anonymous dossier creator in the archives. Uh, this visit happened in 1954 and was a very big deal at the time. Uh, uh, this is a commemorative stamp on, on the occasion. Uh, and in the dossier was all the published correspondence about it, about the visit, over a period of two years between the then British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, various officials at Buckingham Palace, various secretaries of state of Common for Commonwealth Affairs, the Archbishop of Canterbury, two successive prime ministers of Ceylon, the lay custodian Diawadana Nilame of the Temple of the Tooth in Kandy, various British officials on the island, etc., etc. As I read through this collection of letters, minutes of meetings, top secret diagrams, and other exchanges, I became fascinated by one of the things that seems to have particularly preoccupied these leaders at the highest echelons of church and state and sangha in the two countries. And that was whether or not, if and when she viewed the tooth relic, the queen would have to remove her shoes when entering the sanctuary. Something that is a norm, of course, in Buddhist countries, but not the norm for British royalty. Now, some of you may already be familiar with parts of this story since I cover it in the last chapter of my book. But I'm returning to it here because I think it sums up the vagaries and fluctuations uh, and power plays that marked British policy uh, towards not only, uh, not only towards the Buddha's tooth relic, but towards Sri Lankan Buddhism in general from the very start of the British colonial period in the beginning of the uh, 19th century. And at the same time, because it reflects those relations in a post-colonial era, uh, when Ceylon was an independent nation, though it was still part of the British Commonwealth. So we're dealing with 1954, Ceylon is independent at this point. Before starting, however, by way of introduction to myself and to this topic, I thought that I would recount a few personal tooth relic tales of my own in an autobiographical attempt to give you, at least retrospectively, some idea of why I came to be interested in this particular Buddhist relic. I had no idea these were the causes for my interest, but doing this talk, I, I now realize maybe they were. Uh, 
I'm not sure when I first heard about a Buddhist tooth relic in Sri Lanka. I think it was probably as an undergraduate in one of Donald Swearer's classes at Oberlin. In any case, I was already well aware of its existence the year after I finished college when I arrived in Kandy in the fall of 1969 on a travel fellowship from the Watson Foundation. Indeed, the very first thing I did in Kandy was to go to the Temple of the Tooth. More properly, the Palace of the Tooth, the Dalada Maligawa, to see the relic. I remember being rather confused by my visit. I was a product of the 60s, and part of me th still thought that Buddhism should be about meditation exclusively. I knew, of course, that there were ritual and devotional aspects to the religion, but I imagined that these would somehow be sedate and quiet and toned down. So what was all this banging of drums and tooting of horns inside the temple? What was all this glitter? Moreover, where was the tooth? In retrospect, I think I was expecting to see it in open display like certain Roman Catholic relics in Europe. In fact, generally speaking, the tooth is kept behind closed doors in a locked inner sanctum in the innermost of seven bejeweled reliquaries nested one within another like so many matryoshka dolls. Here's what the young man in the slide is sneaking a peek at the outermost Dagoba. And here's the innermost Dagoba, uh, you see on the left, being carried by uh, the monk, uh, usually only visible, quote unquote, when once a year it is taken out from the temple and mounted on the back of an elephant to be paraded through the streets in a festival slash tourist uh, uh, event known as the Esala Perahera. But in 1969, I was not there for the Perahera. I came afterwards. And the closest I ever got to the tooth was a quick glimpse of the outermost reliquary when they briefly opened the doors to the inner sanctum. I quickly became reconciled to this hardly satisfactory viewing, however. It made sense, I told myself, that I should not see the tooth relic, for after all, I had learned from the Buddha in Nirvana. I had learned that the Buddha in Nirvana. I didn't learn anything from the Buddha in Nirvana. I learned that the Buddha in Nirvana is, in the words of the Heart Sutra, gone, gone, gone beyond, gone utterly beyond. Boji Thwaka, Anya Shingyo, and so. When people would ask me, have you been to the temple and seen the tooth? I would rather smugly and cryptically say, no, but I have been to the temple and not seen the tooth, <laughs> as though I had realized that its true nature. I was 20 years old. <laughs> but then at the nearby University of Peradinia library, I read various accounts uh, about privileged foreign persons, heads of state, royals, muckety-mucks, and other well-connected individuals who over the years had seen the tooth unveiled out of all its nested reliquaries. There was, in fact, a whole ritual for unnesting each of the seven Dagabas and gradually removing from them the precious jewels and garlands of gems in order to finally expose the tooth itself. This, I guess, was the beginning of my interest in Westerners such as Queen Elizabeth, who had seen the undressed tooth, the who, why, how, when, and what for of their visits. A second early experience of the tooth took place a couple of months later in Kandy when my wife and I were then living in a garret apartment on the top floor of the Queen's Hotel. You can see our 
our doghouse dormers up to the left there. Uh, our windows overlooked one of the main streets leading to the temple, Sri Dalada Vidya, Holy Tooth Street. One morning we heard the characteristic chant of Sinhalese devotees, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sa. We looked outside and there was a large procession of pilgrims going by, dressed in white, walking down the middle of the street, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sa. We assumed they were headed for the temple, and they most likely did go there. But it turned out the purpose of their journey was to go and see the moon rocks that were being displayed at the United States Information Agency. This was the fall of 1969. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and whoever that third guy was who never set foot on the moon. Uh, they, the previous summer, had been to the moon and uh, the Apollo 11 had brought back rocks and dirt from the lunar surface for scientific analysis or so they said. But the rocks were also very quickly used for political and diplomatic purposes. Lunar rocks were in fact gifted not only to each of the 50 states in this country, but they were also sent on tour to 135 countries worldwide where they were put on display to propagandize the greatness of the USA. They remained in Kandy only a few days before going on to other parts of the island. What interested me, however, was A, that a group of pilgrims could apparently treat the moon rocks and the tooth relic in similar ways. Sadu, sadu, sa. And B, that the State Department had originally wanted the rocks to be shown at the Dalada Maligawa, the temple of the tooth itself. When this was nixed by the Sri Lankan temple authorities, they settled for the U.S. Information Agency, which in those days was directly adjacent to the temple. Moon rocks and tooth relics were thus brought together, enabling Sri Lankan pilgrims to have a double whammy experience. I didn't really start thinking about the historical context of this incident until a few years later when I had another aha moment about the Buddhist tooth. In 1972, when I was in Beijing, I was lucky enough, this was still technically the time of the Cultural Revolution, to be allowed to go and see the recently completed Tooth Relic Pagoda outside of the city. As a result of that visit, I became aware of Beijing's relic diplomacy and learned of the occasion when, in 1961, the Chinese uh, sent their own Buddhist tooth relic to Kandy, where it was carried on elephant back in a full Parahara procession and exhibited in a special pavilion built for it right in front of the Dalada Maligawa. Thousands of people came to venerate it and the New China News Agency proclaimed that the reunion of the two teeth, the Beijing and Kandy relics, symbolized, quote, the new friendship between the people of the two nations. So gradually I began to see the moon rocks as an American response to the Chinese tooth relic visit, which had happened just eight years prior. In fact, it could be argued that the State Department treated the rocks as relics, as did perhaps the people who visited them. Compare, if you will, this image of Buddhist relics put on display 17 years ago here in Berkeley with this image of moon rocks as they were exhibited in 1969. Not, I'm afraid, in Candy, I didn't have pictures of that, but at the New Jersey State Museum. The visit of the moon rocks to Candy in 1969 and of the Chinese tooth uh, relic in 1961 Thus got me thinking not only about the nature of relics as objects. When does a tooth become a relic? When does a rock become a relic? Answer, one of the answers, when they are viewed with awe, sadhu, sadhu, sa. But also about relic politics and relic diplomacy, about how and why 
foreign non-Buddhist governments have used relics in general and the tooth relic in particular for their own purposes. So with this in mind, let me now switch to the Buddhist tooth, the topic of the, uh, the Buddhist tooth in Queen Elizabeth's shoes. Uh, first, a little background. When the British conquered the Candian Kingdom in the early 19th century, they became possessors of the tooth. And rather than carry it off or destroy it in the way the Portuguese had, they decided to have the tooth re-enshrined in its temple in Candy. As part of the policy they had spelled out in 1815 uh, in the so-called Candian Convention. And quoting from Article 5 of that, the religion of Budu, as they called it, professed by the chiefs and inhabitants of these provinces, is declared inviolable, and its rites, ministers, that is, monks, uh, and places of worship are to be maintained and protected that is by the British government. Early on, there were signs that the British colonial authorities took this proclamation seriously. They not only allowed for an elaborate parahera to reinstall the tooth in its temple, but they organized it and participated in it, having Mr. John Doyley, the British government agent in Candy, walk directly behind the elephant bearing the tooth. <coughs> and then going barefoot, let me underline barefoot, that is without shoes, right? into the temple and up to the inner sanctum where he made an offering to the tooth in the name of King George III in his official government capacity, that is, of a golden musical clock. It was a hit. Now this kind of thing was highly objectionable to Protestant missionaries on the island who felt it was subsidizing and encouraging heathenism as well as the Christian societies back home in England. They rallied their forces, wrote tracts, lobbied members of parliament, pressured the colonial office and harangued the British authorities in Ceylon. And by 1847, they succeeded in getting the British government to renege on its ritual responsibilities as guardians of the tooth relic and sponsors of its cult. Formally cutting official ties with the Buddhist religion, the British entrusted custody of the tooth to a committee consisting of the chief lay official of the temple, the Diawadana uh, Nilami, and the abbots of the two principal monasteries in Kandy. The current occupants of those positions, or at least a few years ago, are still in charge of the tooth today. This did not mean, however, that the British colonial office gave up entirely its involvement with the tooth. The government agent in Kandy continued to live in the old royal palace where he complained about the drums, the drums, constantly the drums. It's right next to the temple. Uh, they woke him up every morning. Uh, and he continued to retain one of the keys to the sanctuary doors. Technically and ultimately, the tooth relic was crown property. It belonged to Queen Victoria however remiss in fulfilling her ritual responsibilities towards it she might have been. One of the ways in which the British maintained this kind of distant uh, theoretical ownership was in keeping the prerogative to approve of and arrange for official guests, VIPs, to have special privileges to visit the tooth relic up close in its sanctuary. Among these VIPs were various foreign dignitaries. For example, the Queen Mother of the King of Cambodia, the ex-Queen of Burma, ex because the British had, had arrested and conquered Burma and exiled her husband, uh, the ruling King of Siam, King Chulalongkorn, one of the sons of the Japanese Meiji Emperor, even the 81-year-old widow of Napoleon III, the Empress Eugenie. All of these foreign dignitaries had their own personal and political agendas. I don't know what Empress Eugenie's agenda was, but uh, there we have it. Uh, 
and they had their own political agendas in visiting the Temple of the Truth. But in time, as Anne Blackburn has pointed out, the British began to worry about that their own authority as colonial rulers of the island was being undermined by these foreign visitors. For instance, King Chulalongkorn had been invited to Kandy in part by a group of Sri Lankans who wanted him to become the royal patron of all Buddhist institutions and sects on the island and thereby replace the British in that role who they argued had given up that responsibility. Such things made the British nervous. Accordingly, they decided to mitigate them by arranging for their own royals to visit Kandy and view the tooth relic as a kind of reminder that they were indeed the de facto rulers of Ceylon who did care about Buddhism. So in 1870, Queen Victoria's second son, Prince Albert, a fan of elephant hunting, visited the tooth. In 1875, it was the turn of his older brother, Albert, the future King Edward VII, who viewed it up close. Uh, there you see it, the tooth you can just see beneath Albert's uh, gaze on, on the table there. Uh, then in 1901, Albert's son George, the Duke of Cornwall, came with his wife. And in 1921, so did his son Edward, the future King Edward VIII. All of this then may serve to show that there was nothing new about the visit of Queen Elizabeth in 1954 though she was the first actually reigning English monarch to travel to Ceylon. So the file in the National Archives in London actually starts in April 1952. Near Manchester in England, a Protestant pastor uh, preaches a sermon bemoaning and lambasting the fact that he's just found out that Princess Elizabeth, she was not yet queen, who had just embarked on a tour of the Commonwealth nations, she was in Kenya at the time, was planning when she got to Ceylon to go barefoot into a temple in Kandy and there make an offering of gold to, the heathen, to a heathenish idol, a tooth. This should scandalize all good Christians. The next day, a Labour Party newspaper headlined the sermon this is read by a woman in Cornwall who, as a concerned Christian, writes to her member of parliament asking, is this true? And if it is, can't something be done about it to stop it? <laughs> the MP then forwards all of this to Winston Churchill and asks him as prime minister the same question. Churchill is shocked and upset by this revelation. He has his secretary, Jock, Colville, make inquiries of Buckingham Palace, hoping to be told the report is without foundation. But Elizabeth's private secretary, Martin, those of you who are fans of the TV series The Crown may recognize some of these names. Uh, and you can visualize Martin here. Yeah. Yeah. Soon responds, Martin soon responds that Actually, it is true that Princess Elizabeth was going to visit the view of the tooth, and it was customary for distinguished visitors to make a token donation of three gold sovereigns to the temple. But this was not a religious offering. Moreover, it was also the norm for visitors to the temple to remove their shoes. Quote, just just as visitors to Westminster Abbey take off their hats. But he did not think she was going to go barefoot, no. She would probably wear some kind of slipper. Thus the newspaper article that Jock had seen was sensationalizing things, although he had to state its, its report was basically accurate. At this point, however, the issue becomes moot. Elizabeth's father, King George VI, dies and her tour of the Commonwealth is aborted and she returns to London for the funeral and to become queen. 
to be coronated. The question of what she would or would not do at the Temple of the Tooth in Kanti is thus no longer of concern, at least for the time being. But Churchill knows better. He realizes that once Elizabeth is crowned, at some point she will re-embark on her tour of the colonies and former colonies, and then most likely, bureaucracies being bureaucracies, the originally planned program will simply be reinstated and reenacted. So he has Jock right back to Buckingham Palace to tell Martin that he, the Prime Minister, is pissed. He, he didn't use that term, but uh, he is pissed that he wasn't consulted in this matter. And he insists on being forewarned should the issue come up again in the future, for he himself is opposed to the visit, as he fears that any such action by the Queen is likely to stir up considerable negative repercussions for himself, for the palace, for the government, among Christians in the UK, and everywhere else. Churchill is further worried when he learns that the current Governor General of Ceylon the Queen's representative on the island, and the man who will be in large part responsible for the details of the Ceylon part of the Queen's tour, is firmly of the other opinion that Her Majesty should visit the temple and make an offering of good, and so is likely to push for that again. So it turns out, so, it turn, so too it turns out, is Cecil Sires, Britain's High Commissioner to Ceylon, the equivalent of an ambassador. When Churchill asks him for his opinion, he responds that he also is in favor of the Queen viewing the tooth. While there might be some Christian opposition to this, he admits, her Buddhist subjects in Ceylon and elsewhere would be greatly hurt if she did not. But Ambassador Sires then seeks to allay some of Churchill's concerns. The visit, he tells the Prime Minister, will be a private one and have no religious significance. Moreover, she probably need not make an offering of gold sovereigns. Instead, they could send a check, say for 250 rupees, as a contribution to the building fund. <coughs> Ambassador Sires does warn, however, that in all likelihood, she will have to remove her shoes. But she shouldn't go barefoot. Quote, the temple entrance being normally crowded with beggars and crossed by a great number of people in bare feet is not sanitary. If it is, is not sanitary. If it is imperative that she should remove her shoes, then she should wear several pairs of stockings. This is Sri Lanka, a tropical country. I can't imagine wearing several pairs of stockings. But uh, several pairs of stockings and should use a strong disinfectant afterwards. He then advises Churchill to write privately to the Serenese Prime Minister Dudley Senanayake to get his opinion on this matter. For although Mr. Senanayake, this is a quote, although Mr. Senanayake is a devout Buddhist, he is nonetheless a very reasonable man. Churchill does write to Senanayake. He tells him diplomatically that he, sh he is, is sure the Prime Minister will be the first to realize that were the Queen to remove her shoes and make an offering at the Shrine of the Tooth Relic, there would be some misunderstanding among her Christian subjects in other countries. So is there not some way that she can visit the temple without taking off her shoes and without making a direct offering and without giving offense to Buddhist opinion. Senanayak is not long in answering. In a private, marked private, re reply to Churchill, um, he says that all in all, given the Prime Minister's concerns, it is his considered opinion that the best solution would be simply to omit the visit to the temple altogether. Bingo. Churchill has finally found an ally who has given him just what he wants. He promptly writes to Buckingham Palace, telling them that Prime Minister Sinanayake is opposed to the visit to the Temple of the Tooth. We must cancel it. 
and they do. When the pro official program for the Commonwealth tour is drawn up, it no longer includes a viewing of the relic in Kandy. And that might have been the end of the story, but no, it goes on. In November 1953, the newly coronated Elizabeth and Prince Philip embark on their tour around the world on the royal yacht Britannia. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. They are scheduled to arrive in Ceylon in 1954 after a six month journey to all the choice British Isles in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, and all kinds of places. But before they get there, the plot thickens. In Ceylon, Dudley Senanayake is replaced by a new prime minister, Sir John Kotelawala. And soon a major problem comes to light. Churchill's correspondence with Senanayake had all been marked personal and private. And accordingly, it was never included in the office files that were passed on to the new prime minister. I guess Senanayake took them home with him to his house and <laughs> kept them there. Uh, Kotelawala, therefore, was not aware that the planned visit to the Temple of the Tooth had been cancelled. And he's not happy when he finds out it has been. Whoops! In January 1954, just three months before the royal party's arrival, he writes to Churchill, enclosing a letter, which I suspect he had commissioned, enclosing a letter from the Diawada Nilame of the temple and the abbots of the Malwate and Askiria monasteries in Kandy. And they too apparently did not know the queen was not coming. Uh, for in their letter they officially invite her, a sort of welcome to Kandy letter, officially invite her and her husband to visit the tooth and its jewels and to view a special Raja Perahera, a procession made just for her from the balcony of the octagon at the temple. In his own message to Churchill, Kotelawala then does not mince his words. He tells them that it would be very awkward and insulting to turn down this invitation, that Her Majesty's uncles and ancestors had all visited the temple and viewed the sacred relic, and that for her not to do so as Queen of Ceylon and head of the Commonwealth would give great offense to a large number of her Buddhist and Hindu subjects. Furthermore, should she fail to honor the relic with her presence, there are certain opposition political or leftist parties who would likely boycott her visit altogether and push their demand for Ceylon to quit the Commonwealth and become a republic. <laughs> Moreover, without viewing the tooth, according to Kotelawala, it would make no sense for her to visit Kandy and see a special tooth, uh, torchlight parade of elephants and dancers, and in that case, he, Kotelawala, Quote, might find it necessary to advise Her Majesty to abandon her visit to Ceylon entirely. Whoops! He therefore strongly recommends the temple visit be reinstated in the program. Her Majesty, he assures Churchill, will not have to participate in any religious ritual. All she will have to do is remove her shoes. Churchill now doesn't know what to do. He's inclined to change his mind and agree to Prime Minister Kotelawala's demand, but he resists doing so stubbornly. He resists it entirely. We shall never give up. So he consults his Secretary of State for Commonwealth Affairs, Lord Swinton, and together they hatch a plan to see if they can arrange for the Queen not to remove her footwear, but to put on some kind of overshoe, some kind of booty, the way, he thinks, the way Westerners do when they visit mosques. Then, quote, no one could possibly suggest that the queen was performing an act of worship or homage. 
Accordingly, they telegraphed their governor general in Colombo, Lord Salisbury, and instruct him to make inquiries in that regard. In the meantime, they also sent a, table, a cable to Queen, Eliz uh, Queen Elizabeth, who is now touring Australia, informing her of the situation and asking how Her Majesty would feel were the visit, uh, uh, or, should the vi or should the visit, to the temple maybe just perhaps might have to be put back on the program. Elizabeth replies through her new se private secretary, Michael, that though she had agreed to view the tooth when she was a princess in 1952, actually she was rather relieved when she learned that the visit to the temple had been canceled. For she feels that now, as queen, she has a special responsibility as a religious ex exemplar, since her status has changed and she has now become defender of the faith and supreme governor of the Church of England. But, the queen knows her place, but if Prime Minister Churchill and his cabinet think that she should do this for the good of the Commonwealth, she is willing. But she asks that the Prime Minister get the agreement of the Archbishop of Canterbury. She is mum on the question of her footwear. Meanwhile, in Ceylon, it appears that Prime Minister Kotelawala does try to see if some kind of booty or other exception for the Queen might be arranged. He sends his superintendent of police, Sir Richard Aluvihari, to Kandy to try to strong arm the Diawadana Nilame into accepting a solution, but the latter flatly refuses. He actually slaps the superintendent in the face and declares that neither you nor the Queen of England can give me orders when I am in the Maligawa. So the next day, a telegram marked secret and personal arrives at 10 Downing Street from Lord Solbury in Colombo. And it's written in old telegraphies, uh, the good days of telegrams. Regret, no alternative to removal of shoes possible. Stop. No religious significance attached to it here. Stop. Have consulted Bishop of Colombo regarding views of Anglican community he has no objection to removal. At this, Churchill finally gives in. He convenes a cabinet meeting and gets them to endorse the plan for Her Majesty to visit the temple unshod. He writes to the Archbishop of Canterbury and charms him into giving his approval. He then sends a secret telegram to the Queen to inform her of all this and thank her for her cooperation. Much of the rest of the archive dossier is devoted to correspondence between Downing Street, Buckingham Palace, Commonwealth Affairs, Colombo and the Royal Party on uh, essentially damage con possible damage control. What should be the talking points for the Queen's visit when it happens? Emphasize the pageantry of the Raja Perahera, the glorious costumes of the Candian chief, the record number of caparisoned elephants, the great honor being paid to Her Majesty, de-emphasize the significance of her visit to the tooth and say nothing about her removing her shoes. And if asked about that, point out that this action has no religious meaning, that is just a matter of courtesy. Generally speaking, this strategy succeeds. Newsreel coverage of the event makes no, vis no mention of her visit to the tooth. The Times of London, after a significant goof up uh, in an article written before she goes to Candy, namely she's going to go to the tooth relic as an act of worship, uh, they immediately get the Times to correct, that, uh, correct itself on the following day. And it reports that before viewing the magnificent and colorful Raja Perahera, with its record parade of 140 elephants and a crowd of a million and a half people, 
larger than the crowd at Sri Lankan independence, right, uh, all come to honor her. The queen and her husband visited the temple where, quote, they mounted to the inner sanctuary and saw the sacred relic which had been removed from its nest of jeweled caskets. This interesting experience shared by members of the royal family on previous visits has no religious significance. There is no mention of her shoes and no mention of an offering. The New York Times, however, was less discreet. Its article reporting the event is a short piece entitled, Queen removes shows to see the Buddhist tooth. <laughs> but hey, who pays attention to what Americans say? Right. Okay. In closing, let me make a few quick remarks about this obsessive worry of the British government and the Queen that she should not be seen removing her shoes. First of all, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. When John Doyley in 1815 walked barefoot into the Dalada Maligawa and in the name of King George made an offering to the tooth relic of a golden musical clock, it was viewed as political expediency by some and as scandalous by others. This established a polarity between those British officials, mostly those resident in Sri Lanka, who wished to honor the tooth to ensure the support of Candian chiefs and monks and those officials mostly back in Britain who wished to dishonor or ignore the tooth out of religious or culturally chauvinistic principles. The whole of part two of my book traces the waffling back and forth of the British between these two poles. And the story of Elizabeth's shoes can be seen as a continuation of that waffling, though in a new context. As we have seen, Churchill waffled going from no way to okay, and the queen waffled, caught between her roles as exemplary defender of the faith and at the same time head of the commonwealth. And even the Sri Lankan waffles from one prime minister to the next prime minister, uh, and even Kotilawala waffled in his attempts to get uh, the Diawada Danilame uh, to go along with it. Second, the Commonwealth context is important because it awkward, it's awkwardly ambiguous. And we study a lot colonialism in these countries, uh, but post, immediate post-colonialism is very interesting as well. Elizabeth in 1954 was technically still acknowledged as Queen of Ceylon, just as she is still now, we were talking about this at lunch, as Queen of Canada. But since Ceylon was now independent, she was not Queen of Ceylon in the same way, say, that Queen Victoria had been. This shift in queenly status may be one of the things behind Prime Minister Kotelawala and the Diawada Nanilame's insistence on not letting Elizabeth keep her shoes on in a temple. There was apparently no such uh, insistence prior to independence in 1948. When Prince Albert viewed the tooth in 1875, unfortunately, this drawing is cut off, but I, I, I wager there are boots below the line of, of, of this image. Uh, he wore his boots and no one uh, asked him, I'm sure, to take them off. Uh, the same is true, interestingly, of King Chula Longcorn in of, Thai, of Siam in 1897, who, though a Buddhist, went into the temple in full Western military uniform. But footwear was not just a sign of Western dominance. In traditional Sri Lanka, it was also a marker of social status. Candian chiefs, for example, for all their elaborate costumes, went barefoot. And Candian kings, however, wore shoes. Uh, shoes were important markings. Uh, there was thus a footwear difference between sovereign and subject, and this was re re readily extended to all British rulers. I love this photo where all the Candian chiefs are barefoot, except for the Englishman in the suit uh, in the front uh, who is wearing uh, uh, his shoes. Uh, 
After Sri Lankan independence, however, Elizabeth, the queen of, Sri, of Ceylon, was in fact no longer ruler of Ceylon. The story of the British royalty's dealings with the tooth relic did not end, however, with Queen Elizabeth's visit. Times changed as do mores and sensitivities. Fifty years after the big hoopla concerning Elizabeth's footwear, her son, Prince, now King Charles, made an official trip to Candy. He did, he did not view the relic outside of his nested reliquaries, but he did visit the inner sanctum of the temple, where he not only took off his shoes, but he also made a formal traditional Buddhist offering of a tray of flowers with little apparent controversy. Finally, in the spirit of comparison, I guess, and to bring things up to the present, or almost the present, I want to point out that when former President Trump visited India in 2020, he went to the Gandhi Ashram in Ahmedabad. And there, before entering that sacred place, guess what? He took off his shoes, as did Melania Trump and the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. An astute photographer captured <laughs> the moment after they removed their shoes. I'm sure you've already compared the differences between uh, the shoes. This image from the New York Times must have sent derisive shockwaves throughout India, Sri Lanka, not to mention Japan and other places where footwear removal is routine, but where, quote, dumping your shoes where they fall, unquote, is something characteristic of uncouth middle school boys, a sign of bad upbringing and cultural insensitivity. I like to think that Queen Elizabeth at the Temple of the Tooth neatly placed her own shoes side by side when she took them off and did not feel the need to use a strong disinfectant afterwards. Thank you very much. What sorts of evidence, if any, support the claims to the authenticity of this tooth? That's the first question. And secondly, something that comes up, as I'm sure you know, in regards to the so-called fraud of Turin and other such things, uh, are people who are taking care of this tooth interested in seeking to get scientific uh, verification, or does that seem to be, to them, itself a blasphemy and a lack of faith? Uh. That, that's a, a logical, uh, interesting question which um, I don't have a good answer to because I never know what genuine means uh, in terms of, of the genuineness of the, of the two. Uh, uh, the tooth, as is often pointed out, is clearly not a human tooth or the size of a human tooth. The Buddhist answer to that is usually, well, the Buddha was 16 feet tall and therefore he had, uh, he had a tooth uh, to size, uh, so to speak. I'm not aware of any experiments of trying to find out you know, the age of the tooth and that uh, kind of thing. Uh, some people uh, say that, um, uh, reading the legends, that this can't be the tooth of the Buddha because the Portuguese destroyed the tooth of the Buddha in the 16th century. Uh, the Sri Lankan answer to that is usually uh, the Portuguese, or either the Portuguese thought they destroyed the tooth of the Buddha in the 16th century, but it wasn't the tooth of the Buddha. Or it was the tooth of the Buddha that they destroyed, but they didn't destroy it because when they smashed it, what the Portuguese did is that they uh, smashed it in a, in a mortar and pestle or with a hammer, and they uh, burnt the fragments and they threw the fragments into uh, the river. Uh, they were not taking any chances. but relics being relics, uh, somehow the tooth went through the mortar and 
floated through the ocean and <laughs> arose again in Sri Lanka again as far as the genuine too. Uh, there are also other historical arguments that uh, the tooth was removed from the temple at several times once. It wasn't there when the British conquered Kandy. They had to coax the Sri Lankans to bring it back so that they could re-enshrine it. And then, even at the time, some people said, how do we know this is actually the tooth that they're bringing back? No one has seen this tooth for 70 years, right? Uh, and uh, the adroit uh, John Doyley, who was a government agent in Kandy, said, don't ask that question, right? Uh, we take it to be the tooth. Uh, so it could have been, you know, it goes on and on and on. Uh, so the, one of the reasons I'm not less interested in historic, the you know, ultimate question is a historical question, uh, than, uh, and more interested in stories is that I don't have to answer your, your kind of question. Uh, I did go see the Shroud of Turin, by the way, when I was interested in, in, in Christian relics, when it was on display. Uh, and I must say, the Shroud of Turin was very convincing of being an image uh, on the Shroud. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty clear it doesn't antedate the 11th century. But, uh, Thank you. Yeah, Mark. Thank you very much, John. Great talk. You know, there are so many Buddhist tooth relics around. I wonder if you've done calculations. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't follow. So I said there are so many Buddhist tooth relics in various places. I wonder if you've done a calculation about how many there are. Because recently, Pukyo Daigaku in Kyoto built a little pagoda across the street with a Buddhist tooth relic in it. And that's, that's only about 15 years old. I, and I, I had been there as a grad student and it wasn't there. So I mean, now we have a tooth relic, you know, in Kyoto. And so, uh, you know, that's what I'm just curious about in terms of the... Because I know in the case of uh, relics in Europe, they proliferate, right? That's right. right. Um, and actually there's a, a second tooth relic in, in Kyoto at the Senyuji uh, temple which probably has more authenticity than the, the, the new one. But who knows? I mean, uh, the Buddha had supposedly 40 teeth. Um, that doesn't account for all the, 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 the tooth relics. But you're right, there are stories of even the tooth relics cloning and multiplying uh, and, and uh, increasing in, uh, in, in number. Uh, the, tooth relics that seem to have become, his, in tradition, the most important tooth are the so-called uh, so uh, four eye teeth uh, uh, of the Buddha, uh, including the one in, in Beijing and the one in, in Kyoto that I know about. Uh, by the way, I've been to view all of these tooths uh, and and I failed to see any of them, you know, the, 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 the one at the Senyuji said, oh, we don't keep it here, it gets stolen, so it's in, it, it's in some kura, someplace, some storehouse, right? Uh, and the one in Beijing, you couldn't quite see through the, through the glass darkly, you know, it wasn't quite there, and, and, and you saw what I saw of the one in, in, in Candy. Um, and so, that's again a question I'm not too uh, been too concerned about. In Christianity, the same thing was asked uh, about pieces of the true cross, um, and an archbishop in Belgium said, "Well, we'll just figure it out." So he 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 wrote to all places that he knew of as claiming to have pieces of the true cross, uh, and all these people wrote reports back to him. Uh, including dimensions of their piece of the true cross, and he he put it all to he he added them all up, and in his estimate, it came to less than the amount of wood that it would take 
to make a cross on which to crucify a person. That cross measured by the relic of the, the cross beam of the good thief, which is preserved in Rome uh, there. And he said, therefore, no. And it was Calvin who had said, yeah, there's so many pieces of the true cross that it, you could build a boat and <laughs> sail away on them. Uh, but, uh, but that was scientific proof of, of, of they all fit in. So I think that, uh, that you could do something similar maybe with the tooth relics. But. Yeah. If um, we set aside relics and focus on your next book, which will be about shoes, <laughs> Pope Benedict is famous for his shoes, for not wearing the right shoes. George Bush had a, famously had a shoe thrown at him. Um, can, you, can you speak about the significance religious or otherwise of shoes? Um, I think Alyssa is the, is the one to speak about. She's done shoes in Burma, uh, in Burma and, and she can do that. I can, I can speculate all kinds of, uh, of history of religions kinds of things, you know, the, that uh, shoes, shoes, Shoes elevate you and therefore give you a status that is inappropriate in front of the object of worship. And, and you know, uh, Moses has to take off his shoes in front of the, um, uh, the uh, burning bush and, and all of these uh, kinds of things. But it also obviously goes on much more to a, a status symbol of various kinds. Of, when, when I was first in, in Candy uh, long ago, there were two... Um, there were two uh, soccer leagues of uh, the, the barefoot players and the shoe, the shoeless and the shoe soccer players. And it was very obvious which social class the, the each belonged to in terms of, uh, of that. Uh, and so um, I think it's infinite and, and, and I haven't done thorough interdisciplinary and research on, on, you know, barefoot symbolism and shoes symbolism. Uh, but. The pleasure of um, three panelists for the symposium um, giving talks that basically connect uh, to John's uh, book and to his own lecture. We will start with Anne Blackburn from Cornell University talking about Buddha power as problem and opportunity. We continue with Richard David from Bath College talk, talking about what the British, what's that British couple doing in Jagannath procession. Thoughts on iconoclasm and critical tolerance. And then we'll conclude with the talk by Alicia Turner from York University in Toronto. Uh, Colonial secular imaginaries and European visions of Buddhism in Burma. So each speaker has 25 minutes. We do the Q&A after the talks. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, of course, to come to Cal and to be in the Bay Area, uh, these have become very homey places for me in the last decade or so. After my mother moved down here in 2011, I had the pleasure of spending quite a bit of time here. So to see dear colleagues and, uh, and to be in the region is a pleasure. Uh, very warm thanks to the Berkeley Center for Buddhist Studies and especially to Dr. Sanjol Mahendale for the splendid hospitality. Now, this for me is a very special occasion, not only for being back at Cal and being back in the Bay Area, but all the more because we're here to fet uh, uh, Professor John Strong uh, and his recent book. Um, and I say it's very special for me particularly because uh, as a scholar, certainly I have learned so much from Professor Strong over the years, and also because I consider him one of my teachers. Uh, I had the pleasure of studying with uh, John Strong in Sri Lanka uh, uh, in the 1980s, and our place of, uh, uh, of uh, some of our classes were held in a, a building which, uh, which uh, John Strong uh, mentions uh, briefly in the book, uh, and uh, from it we could kind of look across the Candy Lake and see uh, the Temple of the Tooth. And 
indeed, uh, uh, quite a few of our doings were punctuated by the drums, which uh, so disturbed some of uh, the uh, bureaucrats. But I also uh, uh, want to say that I'm not only here speaking in honor of my teacher, but I'm also, uh, in a way, speaking in honor of my elder brother in lineage, uh, because we share two teachers, uh, uh, Professor Don Square and Professor Frank Reynolds. And so uh, this is a family affair uh, for me as well, and I'm uh, very happy about that. Now, uh, I don't have to tell you after that talk, fabulous talk we had just a few moments ago, that John Strong is a great storyteller. And we know that from what we heard just now, uh, and certainly, and you know it if you've read the book. Uh, this is a person who is a, a past master at telling stories. John Strong tells us stories about stories, and how we can draw histories of Buddhism from narratives. Uh, uh, just a few moments ago, uh, Professor Strong said, I don't do history. Well, and I disagree strongly that uh, Professor Strong shows us many histories through stories and through stories about stories. There are questions that crop up in Professor Strong's work again and again, including in the book which is being rightly celebrated with this award. For instance, what makes it possible for a narrative to be articulated and transmitted in a particular way? Huge question, important question, fundamental question in the history of Buddhism and other uh, contexts. What are the constituents of a story? And whence did this assemblage of narration and reception arise? How do narratives about people and objects do work in the world? Whether affirming these people and objects, denying these people and objects, or ignoring these people and objects. How do we understand the contingency of such work, human and often superhuman contingency? For years, John Strong has helped scholars of South and Southeast Asian Buddhism, as well as other parts of our vast Buddhist world, to imagine environments of multilingual intertextuality stretching from the Indic mainland across the Indian Ocean and land routes as well, both to Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. And this is just John Strong's work for the South and Southeast Asianists, leaving alone very substantial contributions looking further east. In the work of Professor Strong, characters like Ashoka and Upagupta take on specific lives and narrative power in particular locations. Powerful objects, such as Buddha's tooth and other relics, are drawn into plural and sometimes competing accounts of Buddha power across Asia. Whether the protagonists are humans, supernatural beings, or highly charged potencies like Buddha relics, stories about them feed on and contribute to social and intellectual spaces well beyond inscribed leaves and pages of text. Over decades, John Strong has evoked for us how the making and remaking of Buddhism across Asia is and was a matter of persons and the tales they transmitted, constituting collectives. Stories could coincide, they could compete, or they could quietly segue into one another. Stories were part of what made Buddhism recognizable to its participants. These Buddhists also use stories to quarrel with one another and contest. Having sh helped show us all this about Buddhists and their stories in Asia, in the book we celebrate today, John Strong expands further the already multilingual, cosmopolitan, and transregional scope of his work to consider European tales of what they understood to be Buddha's tooth for good or for ill. And here I must say that against the grain of the early 21st century, I put Britain in Europe. Now here again, in this book we celebrate today, Strong is working from his fundamentally, I find them at least, fundamentally important questions. What makes it possible for a narrative to be articulated and transmitted in a particular way? What are the constituents of a story? And whence did this assemblage of narration and reception arise? How do narratives about people and objects do work in the world, whether affirming, denying, or ignoring these people and objects? 
How do we understand the historical contingency of such work? Now, I wanted to lay out these big, these, uh, this kind of an overview of Professor Strong's work because in preparing for the uh, occasion today, I was really thinking back to, to decades of benefiting from the work of our colleague. And I can see and hear in my mind, you know, these stories. I know how the Ashoka Avadana, as understood by John Strong, was part of a formation for me as a younger scholar. And any of us who work on Southeast Asia know that the big puzzling book about Upa Gupta is one of these things that helps us understand just how complex is this history of interaction between the Indic mainland and the thing we call Southeast Asia. And in this work, and certainly in the Upa Gupta book as well, we see from Professor Strong uh, um, a remarkable willingness to move between the pages of the pages and uh, and ola leaves of, of narrative, uh, and, uh, and and the world of, of materiality. Okay, how do these stories relate to the built environment? How do they relate to potent objects, and so on? And so I see the book we celebrate today is you know I I I, I can I can. Um, it, it is a, a coherent uh, emergence for me uh, to see it in the, in the oeuvre of our colleague and teacher John Strong. Now I want to hone in on one of my favorite parts of the book that we are, are celebrating today. It's such a rich book and I had to choose which bits to look at, but the, the part I kept coming back to uh, in my own mind is uh, the first part of the book dealing with uh, Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese tooth as Professor John uh, Strong calls it, uh, Portuguese uh, tales about uh, Buddha's tooth. And as those, some of you know who have already read the book, uh, uh, Professor Strong shows us competing arguments made, for instance, by Portuguese persons at Goa in 1561 about what might or might not have been Buddha's tooth and what should be done with it or about it. At this time, as Professor Strong tells us, the Portuguese in Goa in southwest India had a choice to make between selling or ransoming, as they put it rather more grandly, the tooth to the Burmese king Bayanau or destroying the tooth itself. And in this section of the book, John Strong quotes at length from two opposing arguments that were made in Goa. The one that helped to carry, the one, one was by someone who said, uh, you know, uh, let's get the money, we can do good with it. Uh, and the one, though, the opposing argument that helped carry the day towards the tooth's destruction in that elaborate process of destruction that John Strong uh, uh, told us about just a few moments ago, the argument that helped carry the day towards the tooth's destruction is attributed to an unnamed theologian, the quotes are also in uh, Professor Strong's book, theologian present at uh, what is called uh, um, uh, in Strong's narration, nicely, evocatively, the trial of the tooth. Um, and we know about this from a later work which coalesced these narratives together. Um, writing about um, the trial of the tooth, Professor Strong tells us about a council that was convened by the Portuguese viceroy in Goa, Don Constantino de Braganza, uh, who had the um, probably a formidable task of figuring out uh, what you do about potent objects in the middle of the Inquisition on foreign territory. So Strong's uh, handling of this episode, the trial of the tooth in 16th century Goa, uh, um, uh, is particularly compelling to me because it shows his treatment of it, Strong's treatment of it shows a Portuguese Catholic thinker working with Christian biblical narratives, stories again, tales again, working with Christian biblical narratives when faced with an object that was construed as at once familiar and strange, compelling and despicable. And invoking a story from the Hebrew Bible, a story in which Rachel steals idols to prevent them from being wrongly propitiated by others, 
The Catholic proponent of this view, the theologian at Goa, makes a particular argument. And I want to read a few pa uh, paragraphs from Professor Strong's book, because after all, we are hearing stories about stories. And I think we want to hear the intertextuality of the claim making being made by this theologian at Goa. So having, uh, having um, invoked uh, the story of, of Rachel um, stealing idols for the greater good, he goes on to say, if our king were to send us a resolute order for proper execution, would it be acceptable that we should deliberate, deliberate whether it was right? Surely not. Thus if God, by means of the beautiful and most zealous Rachel and her beloved and most faithful Yaakov, enjoins us to bury this idol, we should do so. How can human intentions be brought into consideration about that which is demanded by God? How can the king of Pegu, in what we now call Burma or Myanmar, how can the king of Pegu regard us as truly being Christians when he sees that we make his idol so precious? Because without a doubt, we will make this tooth more estimable to the idolaters if we sell it to them at such a price. Already the king offers us 300,000 escudos, and now we want to ask a million? So this demon is worth more, in our opinion, than it is to him? The greatest idolater is the one who values the idol the most. Therefore, gentlemen, in the presence of God, we should affirm with Jeremiah, quote, there has been established by me a people by whom idols will be vanquished. Overthrown and made extinct beyond the ends of the earth, and there will be no room for reverence for any other name than mine, unquote. And with Ezekiel, quote, I will lay my sword upon the idolaters to scatter all, scatter all idols and eliminate them from the altars of all, all idolaters whose bones I will turn to dust. Unquote. To dust then this bone must be reduced and exhaled in smoke over live coals. This is what God himself celebrated according to his own Hosea when he gave the bones of the idolaters to the fire. No doubt he was teaching what our most faithful king, now represented in the viceroy before us, should do with this bone. Hence, the divine scripture will be fulfilled." Unquote. Now, I read this because we want stories about stories, but also to highlight that John Strong's invocation of this passage, which he treats at length uh, uh, wonderfully in the book, is an engaging and important reminder, to my mind at least, that Christians, like Buddhists, uh, engaging with what was understood to be Buddha's tooth, did so amidst a swirl of stories. Narratives importantly configured the intertextual space within which a new argument, in this case, destroy the relic seen as idol. What strikes me most about this conjuncture is how the Catholic thinker used biblical narrative to work with something construed as both familiar and strange. As Strong notes in the book, 16th century Catholics, and as most of us, uh, uh, um, uh, many of us may have encountered in, um, in our studies or our travels or whatnot, um, as Strong notes, 16th century Catholics were no strangers to potent ritual objects. And they were also in the business of defending these against certain strands of emergent Protestant theology. To the Catholic thinker I've just quoted, uh, who is quoted in John Strong's book, the thing that might be understood as Buddha's tooth was familiar as something that another but misguided and dangerous religion construed as a source of power in the world. And it was construed as something that could be a point of orientation for the constitution of religious community. In other words, part of the problem of the idol was its capacity to inspire the organization of practitioners. It was familiar as an idol 
a way through biblical discourse of conceptualizing a ritual focus that contravened biblical imperatives about where such devotional focus was allowed. I found it fascinating and telling that telling stories played a crucial role in making what was understood as the idol recognizable, settling something that might be Buddha's tooth into another taxonomy. This is not a relic, this is an idol. On the basis of that, further theological and then social labor, highly performative in ways Strong addresses beautifully in the book, destroy this idol could be undertaken. And as Strong goes on to show in the book, if you look, uh, follow carefully how the idol slash tooth slash for some relic was treated by the Portuguese at Goa, the, um, the ritual performativity of its destruction, uh, as Strong argues, evoked uh, the ways in which um, uh, heretics were being addressed in context of inquisition and potent objects uh, uh, outside the fold of the faith were being handled in a world of, um, of, of no, no, violent uh, uh, inter-traditional uh, handlings of potent materiality. Buddhist stories across Asia had made a thing said to be a tooth of Buddha something to be reckoned with. And at Goa, a particular Catholic thinker met such stories through his own narrative repertoire. So stories made a problem. Stories could be used in arguing a solution. Strong shows us that idolatry was a concept used in somewhat different ways by different Christian Europeans as they encountered what might have been a tooth of Buddha throughout the second millennium AD. Whereas Spence Hardy, writing in a Protestant vein about the Buddha's tooth in Candian Lanka, expressed concern about idolatry at a rather high level of abstraction, at Goa in the 1560s, construing the tooth as an idol operated differently. There, this tooth was brought within the, spe the sphere of what we might now call Catholic reworlding as the Portuguese sought to remake the material space of Goan towns, villages, and households according to the requirements of Catholic and indeed Jesuit pro-church iconoclasm. And I owe this reading uh, absolutely to John Strong's analysis. I found this part of the book absolutely fabulous. Strong compellingly reminds us that when the Viceroy contemned, condemned to fire, the object construed by some as Buddha's tooth and by some as idol, it was a time of intense reflection in both Asia and Europe about powerful ritual objects. The Jesuits' cult of the relics was expanding, and indeed the body relic of Francis Xavier was installed at Goa not long before this occasion. Meanwhile, the Portuguese at Goa were ordered to efface non-Christian materiality in the colony. I want to read you just a tiny, tiny few lines from um, a, a royal order. The order was made several times um, uh, uh, from the court, and I'm going to read a few lines um, uh, attributed to the Queen Regent, uh, Dona Catarina, uh, in 1559. Quote from John Strong's book on page 131, in the island of Goa and its other annexed territories, there should be no more idols, nor images within nor outside of any house, and all those found should be burned and disfigured, nor should it be possible to make them from wood nor stone nor any metal, nor any other materials, nor should it be allowed to have any public Gentile festival indoors or outdoor outside nor should Brahmanical Gentile priests be allowed, nor temple pools for the Gentiles, nor should they be allowed to burn their dead, 
unquote. Strong plausibly argues that the viceroy at Goa may have destroyed the tooth idol in part due to these royal imperatives to iconoclasm circulating at the time. A Buddhist tooth was perhaps just a bit too close to a Hindu or theist murti. In other words, the imminent politics of the Portuguese court and, in, uh, and uh, intra-Christian controversy may have shaped the very publicly performed and then multiply narrated destruction by fire of Buddha's tooth as idol. Interestingly, to me at least, this reveals the collision of more than one political approach to powerful materiality. As I have learned from others, including Richard Davis, Professor Davis, from whom we shall shortly hear, for centuries in South Asia, and we see this also in Southeast Asia with both Buddhist and theist materials, military conquest and the subordination of erstwhile foes often involved the subordination of palladia, uh, 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 material objects of heightened focus in central political ritual spaces. Certain objects, whether theist murtis, Buddha images, or Buddha relics, could be captured and brought into the conqueror's territory and the ritual precincts of the winner. This practice could operate intra-traditionally or inter-traditionally, and even this notion of tradition is a bit of an anachronism, but bear with me for now, um, expressing the encompassment of one sovereign ritual environment by another. However, in these pre-colonial Southern Asian cases, as best I understand them, such political arguments through material did not hinge upon the effacement of less central images. The everyday materiality of the spaces of the conquered was not recast. Practices within which the destruction of a tooth, perhaps Buddha's tooth, occurred were violent. But we can also, and we can also see them as a collision between understandings of how one does politics. I'm thinking along these lines, uh, and I, I don't know enough about this area to, to, to say, speak much further about it, but as I read Professor Strong's book, I became really fascinated to understand more about the reception of this um, moment of um, Iberian intervention in the material spaces of Goa. Think, I'm thinking along these lines, these lines, by which I mean the collision of understandings between how one does politics. I'm thinking along these lines partly because of the excellent work of Zoltan Biedermann, uh, 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 historian of, uh, of Iberian empires in Asia, whose work is also invoked by John Strong, and this is why I was kind of thinking with Zoltan as well as with uh, Professor Strong. Biedermann's work is offered in part uh, as a counterpoint to Sanjay Subramaniam's emphasis on early modern conceptual connectivity across empires. Uh, Subramaniam, as many of you know, was concerned to show how you can think of a sort of a, um, 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 conceptual and epistemological connections across vast spaces in Asia in the, uh, in the um, late pre-modern, early modern, call it what you will, second millennium uh, AD or CE. That work is splendid and it has inspired many of us. Uh, and uh, Professor Biedermann offers a valuable counterpoint to uh, Sanjay Subramaniam's emphasis on early modern conceptual connection by highlighting instances of communication breakdown and category error between, in Biedermann's case, Iberia and Lanka. So drawing on Strong and Biedermann together, I have begun to imagine 16th century Goa as a space of misapprehension, where two ways of doing politics with potent objects were at odds. And now this leads me to a final point, and then I want to check in the time, and we can, I can uh, add a few more or less examples, depending on the time. Yeah. Uh, am I, should I finish already, Alex? And you're close. Uh, close, okay, perfect, yeah. more minutes, Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll give my, give my conclusion. Then there'll be the QA where... Okay, super, I did not mean to take too long, but I'm excited about the book, and so, uh, yeah. Um,
the basic point I want to make is that um, Professor Strong goes on to say in the book, uh, look how many stories about Buddha's tooth there were after the Portuguese destroyed it. it. And see the vitality of uh, uh, making narratives about uh, tooth relic, tooth relics in um, a South and Southeast Asia. And the basic point I wanted to make in the longer remarks, which I'm now uh, uh, radically condensing, is that uh, we see uh, uh, this, this um, durability of storytelling, narrative making, about the tooth relic in Kandy, in Burma, and so on. Uh, despite acts of destruction like the Portuguese uh, um, uh, incineration of tooth slash idol. It should come as this durability of narrative making should come as no surprise to us when we contextualize this in a larger history of uh, Buddhist politics across, certainly across South and Southeast Asia and I think also more widely. That is to say, that by the time that the Portuguese and the British were doing business, political business, that's putting it nicely, doing business in um, uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, they came into a space in which uh, being able to tell uh, multiple conflicting and competing stories about potent objects such as relics was the way in which uh, the discourse of politics had been running for centuries. And so it is no surprise, as Professor Strong shows so eloquently with respect to the candy and tooth, that um, uh, there was always a story at the ready to authorize um, the tooth relic at candy and the tooth relic in other locations in Asia. Um, and we can see, I think, um, uh, the, this as an instance of the, the durability of a political um, practice and a political imaginaire, if you will, um, uh, functioning across uh, Asian spaces and certainly across Indian Ocean spaces, despite uh, the onset of these Portuguese and then uh, British colonial projects in the region. Uh, in some sense, at least from the work I've been doing um, on second millennium materials and in the Candian context, we can see that uh, the Buddhists, um, Buddhist political logics and uh, story making very often had the last word. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Davis, Richard Davis, from Bath College. Thank you very much for coming yeah. and being the next speaker. Okay, thank you. So, very briefly, I want to thank the uh, Numata award folks uh, and to the organizers um, to John for writing a, a, a super book uh, a terrific book and for a wonderful talk um, and for and for um, sort of kicking off this this part of the symposium and I'm glad to be the uh, sort of honorary uh, Hinduists here among the Buddhists and the Buddhologists um, I've been interested for some time in processions and representations of processions, and so I'd like to use this particular representation, uh, this image, as an organizing center for my talk. So we're just going to look at this for a minute. Uh, this is called the Idol Jagannath on his car during the Ratichatra in 1822. This is a kind of painting that's normally classified as company school painting that is done by Indian artists for British patrons. So the painting is a watercolor. It's about 20 by 30 inches. It's now in the Victoria and, and Albert Museum. The dominant element is the 16-wheeled ch temple chariot adorned with saffron and vermilion dome. The curtain is open. I think I have a pointer here. Let's see if I can do it. The curtain is open here so we can see at the center the idol Jagannath, that is Vishnu Jagannatha, drawn through the city of Puri during the annual chariot festival. In the upper left, we see uh, uh, the same chariot shown head on, uh, seeming to float above the scene. On the chariot platform, there are about 20 uh, priests 
uh, holding chowries, conches, symbols, and blowing S-shaped horns. Surrounding the chariot, there's a large group of rope pullers uh, with their dotis hitched up, ready for action. The procession itself is at a moment of rest. Uh, the rope pullers have put down their ropes and they turn around to face Jagannath. And then out of this sea of Indian humanity, there are two large elephants with howdahs. Closest to the chariot is a princely figure in Indo-Persian court attire and an attendant with a peacock fan. And then the second elephant, larger but more austere decoration, and there's a British couple. The male has a red coat and hat typical of early 19th century British military officers. The female, the only female in the composition, wears a simple high-waisted Regency period British dress and no hat. Both gesture with their left hands toward Jagannath and the image with its stumpy arms seems to beckon out towards the British couple. So the primary visual axis here is this horizontal sight line between the British couple and Jagannath. So the question, the title of the talk is, what's this British couple doing in Jagannath's procession? And then, of course, what does this, any of this have to do with the Buddha's tooth? Now, John Strong pays close attention to the actions and narratives about the actions of European colonizing powers as they sought to extend control over the island of Sri Lanka. And to their actions in relationship to the Buddha tooth as a long-standing object of religious political charisma, often a palladium of Sri Lankan rule. And he used various terms, uh, tensions, um, polarities, and the one that I like, waffling. Uh, and so in this uh, talk, I want to tell a, a short parallel story from Orissa involving a Hindu icon. So this is really just a, intended as a Hindu parallel. In the early 19th century, British colonial officials were heirs to an Enlightenment episteme and could view the tooth as an important religious object for Buddhists with political dimensions in Sri Lankan authority. And so too with the image of uh, Vishnu Jagannath in Puri. Since religion could be defined as a matter of personal belief in a world that included multiple religious faiths, British officials could take a tolerant view of the beliefs of local Buddhists regarding the tooth seeing themselves as modern rational Christians, officials of the East India Company in India, adopted as a colonizing theory in South Asia, that it would be possible and desirable to honor existing native practices and to participate tactically without assenting to those beliefs. So they initially portrayed themselves I think uh, in, in India and, and in Sri Lanka as uh, in a conservative role when it came to religion and social customs as preservers of ancient customs against recent usurpers. Uh, so, and John um, quoted the same quote that I'm gonna give uh, British officials in Lanka said, John Doyley said, the religion of Budo professed by the chiefs and inhabitants of these provinces is declared inviolable and its rights, ministers, and places of worship are to be maintained and, protect, and protected. So I call this critical tolerance uh, since it officially tolerates multiple religious faiths and practices within an overarching order, I use a capital O, that subordinates all of them within a, a, a meta-religion, I like um, uh, James Lane's term here. Strong place pays close attention to the British official John Doyley, uh, a particularly adept student of local Buddhism and a particularly effective 
colonial agent. The two of those things were very closely tied together. And Doily took a keen interest in ensuring that the Buddha tooth, which had been taken away from uh, Kandy during the British attack, was brought back and reinstalled in all proper pomp. And uh, John has a wonderful uh, description of the, whoops, that's the wrong one, of the uh, procession that followed the restoration of the tooth in its proper place uh, in which John Doyley, uh, as he said, marched behind the tooth. I don't know, this, this I have not been able to get much information about, but this is a, uh, a company school style painting of a Buddha tooth procession from uh, Kandy. Strong also describes the counterattack coming from his English flank of British evangelicals against any colonial participation and support of heathen practices. And so John, uh, Strong uh, uh, clearly identifies the tension, again, the waffling, the polarities, but, uh, between two ways of, of not just being British, but being Christian uh, for early 19th century Britons. OK, so this brings us back to Jagannath's procession in 1822. Dating back to the 12th century, Vishnu Jagannath had been recognized as the true overlord of Orissa, with the king serving as his regent. And British officials recognized Jagannath's political importance within local authority systems. Accordingly, when Lieutenant Colonel Campbell prepared to attack Orissa in 1803, as part of the British War on the Marathas, Governor General Arthur Wellesley sent him a dispatch. He said, on your arrival at Juggernaut, you will employ every possible precaution to preserve the respect due to the pagoda and to the religious prejudices of the Brahmins and pilgrimages, pilgrims, and, and so on and so on. So when the British troops reached Puri, they received a report from the priests that Jagannatha, Jagannatha was prepared to accept the British as the new guardians of his temple and its domain. So according to the British view, the Marathas had usurped the sovereignty over Arissa from the local ruler, the Kurdaraja, and the British were simply removing the usurpers with Jagannatha's approval. And so they claimed to honor all existing religious arrangements, but also reserve the right to reform practices they judged to be corrupt due to Maratha neglect. The annual Yatra was a bit of a problem, though. This was undoubtedly a crucial public enactment of religio-political authority, one in which royal authority was expected to participate. In the case of Jagannath, the prevailing ruler, the local ruler, was expected to sprinkle the gods' chariots with water and then dust them with a broom, and then he should put on a silk-colored pillow on his head and push the chariot from behind. Now, the question of British officials actually marching in Indian processions and in a subservient position was a tricky business. So when does critical tolerance shift over into acquiescence in idolatry? And who gets to determine this? British officials sometimes did have themselves, uh, did sometimes join with native rulers in processions in the late 18th and early 19th centuries as participants in enactments of sovereignty. So Charles Metcalfe, in this particular uh, um, uh, uh, set of drawings, uh, Charles Metcalfe, resident at the Mughal court in Delhi in the 1830s, had himself painted in the Mughals Eid, Eid procession, and he commissioned the Delhi artist Mazar Ali Khan to make a set of drawings including a processional panorama 
and mounted them in a family album. And so uh, uh, this is, these are three segments of that. Uh, and uh, so he, let's see if we can find. So the Moogle is here and then Metcalf is down here. So, and this is the front, second, and third of a very long uh, panorama. It was unobjectionable to parade along with a Mughal, who, according to British um, you know, uh, theory, remained the nominal emperor. But what about when the main figure was an Indian religious idol? So we have this top uh, panorama, which is 24 feet long. And this is just a part of it. Uh, so this is a, a part of the panorama. And then this is an enlargement of this section here. This was painted in Mysore about 1860. And the aged Krishna Raja Vodeyar uh, leads a procession of Shiva. Right? So here's Krishna Raja Vodeyar. Back here are the images, right? Shiva, I can't remember, Durga is back there, and somebody else. Behind him, behind Vodiar, is the British resident Colonel Mark Cubbon, who is not looking very happy <laughs> about being a participant here. And I like it, um, uh, Mildred Archer in her great book about uh, company paintings uh, put Colonel Cubbon on the front cover. So the British might be willing to march with human sovereigns in Eid processions, but servile attendance on what they considered an idol was distressing. So one solution, um, our, our couple, going back to Juggernaut, uh, are depicted not as participants, but as observers or tourists being shown the procession. So here's another example of uh, British officials as tourists. So this is of the Hari Har festival uh, near Patna, painted in the picturesque style by uh, Indian artist Sewak Ram, who was a painter of the, of the Patna school. And the European couple, of course, in the picturesque style, there they are, on a boat. Uh, the uh, European couple, probably Governor General Amherst and his wife, Lady Amherst, approached by a boat to observe. So obser observation and tourism does not entail any assent to the political or religious premises of the ritual. Okay. Now we're going to go back. So who are the Brits who are watching the Jagannath Ratyatra. This painting that we've been talking about is a part of a series, a set of eight paintings done in Orissa. Um, and these and another set of paintings of Mughal architecture and ornamental detail were given as a set to the Victorian Albert Museum by Ramsey W. Phipps in 1920. Ramsey W. Phipps was a descendant of Colonel Palnell Phipps, who served in India from 1799 to 1823. And Colonel Phipps arrived in India in 1799. He worked his way up to the new post of superintendent of buildings in the lower provinces in 1816. And for his work, he recruited a crew of Indian artists from Delhi. And according to a biography of Phipps written by his own son, uh, Phipps had, and I quote, a, a staff of very skillful draftsmen in his employ. And he had his men make drawings, by which means he obtained a very valuable collection of pictures of the most celebrated temples, tombs, and palaces, which are bound together in a book which we possess, the family. These include, um, Phipps's son goes on, 
uh, the Taj in Agra, and also uh, the Temple of Juggernaut. Uh, and he says, the Temple of Juggernaut, which at that time no European might see, so questions of visibility like the Buddha tooth, but which my father had drawn by natives for his use when repairs were necessary. So in 1822, Phipps spent several months in Orissa and had drawings and plans made of several buildings. And during his stay, temple authorities accommodated him generously and allowed his assistants unusual access. And Phipps also attended the Ratyatra and had, again, according to his son's biography, a drawing made of the great car of the idol. So we're back to this painting. So this is the drawing we've been looking at, in which I argue Phipps's Indian assistant included his boss in the composition. And the female is Phipps's second wife, Sophia Matilda Arnold Phipps, who's the daughter of the former general, Benedict Arnold, of Norwich, Connecticut who, of course, had relocated to England. The very skillful native draftsman executing Phipps's assignment has had the wit not only to show us the great car, but also to show Phipps and Sophia as sympathetic viewers of the procession, and to suggest a visual connection, a kind of a darshan, passing between the Hindu god and the British official. But there's a twist here, a waffling, a tension between the British patron and the Indian artist in his employ. And it is the same tension that Strong points to in the British treatment of the tooth. The Indian artist may have been engaging in wishful thinking, for Phipps was in no risk of um, honoring a Hindu idol. In an article he published in 1824 in the Missionary Register, Phipps revealed a very different attitude. He says, the idol juggernaut, which is so celebrated that pilgrims resort to worship it from the remotest parts of India, is probably the coarsest image in the country. A Christian is almost led to think that it was an attempt to see how low idolatry could debase the human mind. So a little background here. Phipps, after the death of his first wife, Phipps and his good friend Edward Arnold, that was Sophia's brother, had turned for solace to the young chaplain, Reverend Daniel Corey, and had become impressed with very strong religious convictions. And from then on, Phipps took a strong interest in missionary activities, and so in his official capacity as superintendent of buildings, he was able to recycle funds from Hindu temples, which he acquired in his official capacities, to Christian churches and schools operated by Khoury. Now, Juggernaut figured as a major topic in the British debate over colonial policy and Hindu idolatry, thanks largely to Claudius Buchanan, who was vice provost of the College of Fort William. Previously, the British had recognized the regional importance of Juggernaut, but Buchanan was the first one to promote the idea that the deity was the central god of Hinduism. He, he, called, he said, this is the, the chief seat of the Hindu religion, what Mecca is to the Mohammedans, the Moloch of the heathen world. And Buchanan also sets forth all the major uh, tropes of missionary polemic against Juggernaut, the human bones of the dead pilgrims lining the road to Puri, fanatics tossing themselves beneath the wheels of Juggernaut's chariot, and priests offering, daily, offering the deity libations of blood. So inspired by Buchanan, Reverend James Peggs, and two others opened a mission near Puri in 1821. Phipps visited the mission the following year, when he was there in 1822, uh, during his work in Orissa. 
Now, the, the PEGS mission was no success. And after several works of, uh, several years of work, they had made only one convert. And so in 1832, they closed it down. It was closed down. Peggs returned to England, but he kept up his campaign against Juggernaut. He wrote copious, copiously to the East India Company, urging it to dissociate itself from participation in and seeming support of idolatrous practices. And Peggs finally persuaded a member of parliament to move a resolution against British idolatry. And over the next 20 years, the East India Company gradually detached its officials from all engagements in Hindu practices. Barney Cohn talked about this as a contradiction in the uh, British theory of authority in early colonial India. Now, Pegs, uh, I should say, also shows up in the missionary campaign against the Buddha tooth. He was not solely against uh, Hindu idols, but he was also against um, uh, Buddhist ones as well. So I take this 1822 company school painting as pointing to two views of a procession and as, represent, as representative of a moment of struggle, waffling, transition in the British attitude towards Indian ceremonial. The native artist in Phipps's service provides an optimistic rendering of Juggernaut's ecumenical spirit and of Phipps and his wife as willing participants sharing a visual exchange with the Hindu god. The painting alludes to Jagannatha's embrace of the invading British in 1803 and to the generous access shown to Phipps by the god and the priests of the temple. But Phipps's own attitude had come to differ greatly from what his draftsmen depicted. He sided with the missionary evaluation and this soon became the dominant British judgment concerning British engagement in native religious practices. So this company school painting depicts a moment of mutuality that was disappearing even in the moment that it was painted. The final panelist for the symposium will be Professor Alicia Turner from York University, please. Thank you for, for inviting me and having me here. I want to congratulate Professor John Strong on a really amazing book um, and, and one that, that I think rightly deserves the award. I, I really have learned a lot from this as well as from his work uh, over the years. But also thank you for inviting me to be part of this symposium. Um, I think we bring some interesting different perspectives together on this. So I'm hoping it's not too presumptuous to come and celebrate a book um, and argue for its demonstrating the arguments of a theoretical field that I don't really think that the author intended. Uh, what I find in the, the Buddhist tooth particularly useful for thinking up through the workings of colonial secularism and the implications of critical secular studies for the study of Buddhism. And I don't presume this is where Professor Strong started from, but I think it teaches us a lot in this, and I want to draw some connections there. I really appreciate the nuance of the historical research and what it helps us see about how Buddhism and colonial secularism were co-constructed in practice. From the start, I found uh, really the foundational aspects of thinking critical, critical secular studies to be there in the book. And the two, two pieces I really want to highlight is first that secularism is about the creation of religion as an operative category, creating a conceptual grammar in, from the work out of Talal Asad and Sabah Mahmood, but also multiplying this or going on further, that there were multiple and contested modes of understanding these categories and grammars, and that it was about the politics of how these work together. And I really see in the depictions of the Buddhist tooth this work. 
And so from Sabah Mahmoud, secularism is simply, not simply an organizing structure for what are regularly taken to be a priority um, elements of social organization that is public, private, political, religious, but it is a discursive operation of power that generates those very spheres, establishes their boundaries, suffuses them with content such that they come to acquire a natural quality. And I think in many ways in the discussion of the tooth, we see the actual workings out of what religion is going to mean with the state and how its operations are going to be vis-a-vis -vis the state. I particularly appreciate the attention that the Buddhist tooth paid to the differing interpretations of what constituted religion and how the proper relation of the colonial state to religion should carry out the colonial project. In many ways, the story of the Candian tooth, and this is the one that, that interests me the most in part because my time periods and, and such overlap. I think that the, the Strong's discussion of the Candian tooth encapsulates in this very short period between 1813 and 1830s a compressed example of the transformations of colonial secularism and, and the ways in which it had interpreted and constructed religion across South and Southeast Asia. And, and from Dorley, um, Doyle's explicit recognition that the political and religious aspects could not be separated, that these were two aspects of the ritual cult, but that his ritual participation in this cosmopolitan object was, would establish British sovereignty, it would do the political work, but it need not be an exclusive religious position within this. And then we get the Spence Hardy's uh, uh, missionary objection, the participation actually creates an established religion instead. Um, and, and that not only is it contrary to the principles of secularism that the British should be putting forward, but it's also really contrary to the civilizing Christianal, Christian rationale, the civilizing mission that justifies colonial projects. So actually participation in this did not create sovereignty, but undermined it because it was undermining the colonial pro uh, project as a whole. But the one I like, the sort of third intervention in between is an objection that comes in the, in the letters to the editor, to the responses here, um, that say that the British participation in the rituals with the tooth relic didn't violate colonial secular principles because the British were actually saving the Kandians from a, a more oppressive and more backward religion, that is Hinduism. That Buddhism was somehow the more acceptable religion in this spot, more closely allied with British interests. And here I like the ways in which we're working out a, a construction of good religion and bad religion, constructing a world religion's view that we have these discrete traditions of of Hinduism, Buddhism, and this kind of working out. And I really, I, I see, and then, and then that final moment of that in which the colonial state, feeling that it can't participate, actually goes ahead and, and really creates institutionalized forms for the practice of these ritual ways, creating the systems of trustees to take the place of the sovereign. And in that way, colonial secularism very much producing religious and religious authority. Um, and one of the things I like about this is that that uh, the the work that folks have done on on thinking through secularism in India, particularly in Nadini's Chatterjee's *The Making of Indian Secularism*, really charts that history in detail, really wonderful detail through the whole of the 19th century. And here we have, really, in a handful of episodes, all of those positions being worked out in the Candian um, episode. Uh, so I really, I really think that this does a lot for us. But the other aspect that I think it helps us see and the arguments that critical secular studies really wants to bring to us is that it is in the competition and the multiplicity in which the work of constructing religion happens. So Benjamin Berger here argues, as the local and lived experiences tend to get stripped away in favor of explanatory capaciousness, right? Secularism is a single thing. The British had a policy about religion. So too is the way in which history and struggle themselves have constituted the concept of the secular and the way in which an appeal to con such concepts sustains and entrenches those relations of power. The local shape of the secular has more to do with the particularities of the political history. And this is what I love that the Buddha tooth really lays out all of those details and particularities than any particular period of per principle. Um, and I, I like, I love this work and I'm really fascinated about it. Uh, not only because I could talk
talk about shoes and hats uh, and, and relics for, for all day and tolerance as, as these questions. Uh, but my work, I'm really interested in thinking through what it is that how colonial secularism in Burma work to construct Buddhism as a religion through discourses that, that depicted Buddhism as somehow different and Burmese as somehow different. Um, and in doing so, valorized Buddhism, Buddhist ideals by allying them with particular Victorian uh, uh, liberal values. So claims that the Burmese at first and then later Buddhism were particularly tolerant, that they practiced a kind of religious tolerance um, that was different than others in Asia, that the Burmese first and then uh, Buddhists in particular were particularly good for women, that they created a freedom for women. And in this way they valorized Buddhism and set it aside, uh, apart and but the, what, what I really see in this, and I, and I see parallels that's happening in the Kandian object, is that what the, the discursive work there is actually in the construction of the others. And so every time we're talked about the religious tolerance of the Burmese or the religious tolerance of the Buddhists, what it's really doing is constructing Hindus and Muslims as intolerant. What, what, every time we get this discursive reference to the Buddhists as particularly good for women or freeing women, what we get is the, is the discursive production of Hindu and, and Muslim misogyny. And for me, I, I'm interested in how this works itself out in constructing both the category of religion and Buddhism, because I'm interested in the very long histories of, of the ways in which religious identities have become fixed and fragile and, and racialized in the present. So that, that's the work I, I, where I see some of this happening in the Kandian situation and, and where I, I go with it. Um, but today I just want to, I want to give you one little, um, a little comparison to a moment in Burma in which I think a lot of the similar uh, multiplicities of different possibilities of what the relationship between the state and Buddhism would be and the multiplicities of how the colonial project was constructing Buddhism happened simultaneously. And I'm really inspired by the idea that, that these things happen in a short period of time. So I want to talk to you actually about what's happening in Rangoon um, in a few months in 1853. Um, and, and to start this off, the, the, the Clause 5 of the Kandian Convention that Professor Strong highlights for us really gives us this idea, lays out a language of a practice of defense of religion. And this, this kind of defense of religion was really common. So in all three of the Anglo-Burmese wars, at the, at the moment in which the British take over, the first thing they say to the Burmese people of that area is, don't worry, we won't interfere with your religion. So in 1825 18, uh, here, rest assured, your wives and children will be defended, life and property will be protected, your religion will be respected, and your priests and religious edifices secured from insult and injury. And so we get the, a list of what it is that we will do as the British, that you shouldn't be worried about us coming in. And in similar, we get a similar statement in 1885 at the Third Anglo-Burmese Wars. Peace, priests will be protected, allowed to carry on their duties. The precincts of monasteries, simas, pagodas will be respected once the war's over. Um, and the Buddhist image, religion will remain the religion of the country. I find this interesting um, that and at the first moment of sovereignty, one of the first things the British needs to say and continue to repeat over and over is, we will not harm your religion. And I think this tells us a lot, a lot more about the British than it does about actually the fears of the Burmese. It may be about their perceptions of what the fears of the Bur Burmese fears are, but I think it tells us a lot more about the ways in which the British are constructing and perceiving colonial sovereignty. Um, and so if you think through the ways in which there's a narrative of the sovereignty of the modern state coming out of these wars of religion and the choice that the state somehow stands apart from religion is what causes it to necessarily be legitimate. That if the state, that if the colonial project was partial, then it wouldn't be legitimate. It's part of the colonial thinking about what makes the, their, own, um, their own legitimacy in these concepts. But I think take it further, conceptually, if the sovereignty of the state requires that it has to stand outside of religion, 
In doing so, they need to identify these religions that they're standing outside of. And they end up doing this work of constructing Buddhism and constructing religion out of their work of stepping apart from it. Um, so I want to take you to a couple episodes that happen in, in the fall of, of 1853. We have the conclusion of the Second Anglo-Burmese War, which is going to end up with the British taking all of Lower Burma. And uh, Arthur Fair, who's the newly appointed commissioner of the province, and Lord Dallasy, governor general in India, are engaged in pretty heavy negotiations about the future of this colony. They're getting pressure from London. They want an official treaty in which the Burmese king signs over this territory. The problem is, in the months between the, the end of the war and now, there's been a coup and we have a new king in Mandalay, uh, well not Mandalay, sorry, yet, uh, in, in Upper Burma, King Mindon, who himself had actually opposed the war and he's facing a crisis of legitimacy. He doesn't look particularly legitimate and he does, he's having trouble negotiating this out. And in fact, at one point in the negotiation, she says, could, could we just have a little bit more war? Um, so, so we'll just have three months in which we fight. We'll keep the territories all the same at the end of it. Not a problem. I know you would conquer us if we went back to real war. But I just need to show my people that I, I can be at the head of an army and have legitimacy. That, that doesn't win, by the way. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't go very far with that. Instead, sort of, Mindan is famous for staking his claims to legitimacy as the defender of the Buddhasasana. Um, and he's known for creating Mandalay as a city, for editing and inscribing the text, all of these things. But it's actually his first attempt at legitimacy in this way is he asks to send donations down the river to, uh, to uh, Rangoon and to other places in Pagoda, but specifically to the Shwedagon Pagoda, and to make royal donations to the Shwedagon Pagoda, which houses the hairs of the Buddha. Uh, Fair and Dallasy are, are not particularly happy or convinced about this. Um, Fair says no, quite clearly. Um, and he says here, writing to Dallasy, uh, the application of the Wunjis, the bearers of royal offerings, um, I have rejected it. I trust you'll approve of my refusal for the reason it would create this appearance of a, a royal party, it would create doubts in, in the local populations. And Dallasy writes back that he is rejoiced at the ways in which Fair has rejected this. This is absolutely in, in agreement with his understanding of the relationship between the British colonial state and, and the Burmese king. He says, these ministers of, of, of the king, dressed in their robes on a royal golden boat, would parade the whole length of Bago. It declares the custom of the king to send these gifts annually. We set up a precedent. The Altis keep coming. There's no way we're going to stop this. Um, and, and a mission would create in the eyes of the people of Pugo uh, nothing less than a triumphal procession symbolizing the future restoration of the king. Absolutely not. No way we're going to let him do this unless he signs the formal treaty in which he says this is our territory. Um, and so we get in this moment, I think, one interpretation of the relationship of colonial power to religion, which is to say, like Doily, here Dallasy and Fair really recognize that control over the Shwedagon Pagoda, control over the relics of the Buddha, cannot, you can no way separate religion and politics in that space, and that they are enmeshed, and that British sovereignty is, needs to be performed through demonstrating their control over the pagoda and the relics there. But at the same time, <laughs> in literally in the same letter, um, we get another sort of conundrum that comes up. So in the next paragraph, after Dallas, he has told us how happy he is that we're not going to allow Minden to make these gifts, um, he gives another issue going on at the same time, a very different interpretation about the relationship between the British colonial state and religion. In this time period, news had reached King Mindon um, that the British soldiers had been drilling into the side of the Shwedagon Pagoda. And there's actually rumors circulating in the royal capitals that 
the pagoda has been destroyed, that the relics have been taken, that there's wide-scale looting and harm happening. And you know, in these letters coming down, I want to send my royal gifts, there's a concern that yeah, I want to make sure it's still there. What have you done to our relics? Word of this gets to Fair, and Fair has known, he's on the ground in Rangoon, he's known that there's actually a fair bit of looting going on, and he's tried to chastise the military and the soldiers who are doing them. It hasn't worked, and so he calls Dad. Um, he, he writes to Dallacy, decides to inform him of this, and Dallacy comes back with what, what he himself terms his thundering order about pagodas. And he comes out in no questionable terms with a, an order he, want, he wants um, put out publicly, chastising all of the soldiers for any form of looting that's happening. Um, and he wants it translated into Burmese and made public because he wants them to know, he wants the local population to know that it is in no way in keeping with British policy re in relationship to religion to allow British soldiers to loot uh, reliquaries of the Buddha. This is not acceptable. And so he, he writes, our most noble governor in general, he needs to puff himself up a bit, has learned of the regret and dis, uh, with regret and dissatisfaction the continued destruction and injury of pagodas and places of worship throughout the province of Bago. Uh, such acts of violence in an open time of war can't wholly be prevented, but his lordship and council feel strongly that scandal, which their continuance is now calculated to bring upon our national character, a exasperation and which open and almost universal desecration of sacred places may produce in the minds of the people of Bago. He therefore desires to notify all who are in his service that whoever has proved to offend shall hereafter be, have, uh, be punished with prompt severity. This is just on the edge of war. This is a governor general of India. This is an incredibly strong statement to those soldiers under his command in Rangoon. And um, I read in this that in the same way that Fair and Dallacy are quite concerned that Mindon making a donation to the relics, uh, uh, to the Shwedagon Pagoda with the hair relics would in some way threaten their sovereignty, would threaten the idea of British sovereignty. At the same time, I think Dallacy is equally concerned that the idea of agents of British colonialism going through wanton des desecration and interference with local religion would equally undermine their sovereignty. If British sovereignty requires this distance from religion, this correct understanding that religion cannot be interfered with, this concept of, of non-interference, then the looting that's going on, and had actually was quite widespread in places, um, was a threat to sovereignty. And then there's a third thing that's happening at exactly the same time, still at the Shwedagon, still in the same months. Um, we get Fair, who's on the ground, has to deal with the local population, who would still like to make offerings to the Shwedagon, which is fairly normal. Um, and in addition with the group of people that he refers to as pagoda servants, who have respons ritual responsibilities for both maintaining the Shwedagon, but also for performing rituals there. The Shwedagon has been taken as a military establishment. It, they had taken, the, it is the highest and most defensible place. Not only had they stationed troops on the pagoda platform, they had affixed guns on the platform, and the military cantonment was going to be in the land surrounding it. And so here, Fair is literally um, forced to locate the boundary between religion and state. He has to figure out where he can locate the guns, where he can locate the troops, but also where it's going to be possible for Buddhists to participate and come in. And he decides that Buddhism can go forward without any problem so long as they have access to one of the four cardinal entrances, so long as the pagoda servants have four of these somewhat dilapidated buildings on the grounds, so long as they come on the monthly feast days, but only the monthly feast days, and so long as pilgrims can circumambulate all the way around. And in doing so, not only does he 
quite literally construct orthodoxy, construct what is possible Buddhist practice, but he also um, says that the management of these pagoda servants, the decisions about how these things are going to operate, need to go to a committee of local folks. And here we have him instituting and creating an institution of Buddhism within there. Um, what I like about this, uh, what I think is useful and where I see the real connections to what's happening in this in brief period in Kandi, in Kandy, is this multiple modes of, wh of what, how colonial project will define religion, how the colonial project will define its relationship with religion, and in particular, how it will define Buddhism, happening all simultaneously. And you can see the contradiction involved, but also the competition. And, and I take from that that exactly the competition is the operation of power that, that we're interested in, in in this moment. So this is my, my offering to you, and I really want to thank, uh, thank Professor Strong for this book. It is wonderful. Thank you.